still waiting for the coffee to kick in. But y'all look happy, so so we'll we'll take that. I know for maybe summer for you, uh, you cowboy fans, the great news for you is they can't lose today and ruin your Sunday. So, oh, um, so that uh, that probably contributes to a, to a good bit of the joy. Uh, but man, uh, I am honored to, to just spend the morning with you guys. I mean, to open up the Word of God. And so, if you did bring a copy of God's Word, turn with me to Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five. We'll read the first five verses of the chapter here in a moment. So. As you turn there, you can just leave it open in your lap or put the little handy-dandy bookmark in there. Uh, We'll get there in just a moment. I do want to go ahead and, like, tackle the big armless elephant in the middle of the room right now because y'all are are looking at the floppy sleeves and and you're going, I have so many questions right now. Um, So let me me deal with that one head on. I wasn't a bear or a shark or anything wild and crazy. Uh, This was... uh, Man, this is just the product of how God chose to fearfully and wonderfully make me. Man, I have, um, I, this, is, this is all I've known, you know. Uh, I think it's kind of wild that you guys with your arms and your hands and, I mean, I think it's bizarre you armed people, man. Like, you got to carry these, like, floppy things around on your shoulders all day and I'm just going to enjoy being more dynamic than you, you know? Like, that's a, that's the benefit of my situation. Um, but for the other, like, 8,000 questions you have in the back of your brain, like, okay, so he's born this way, but how does he, how does he ride? How do you, how do you, how do you drive here? How do you, know, I've, I've got questions. Um, so the best way I can explain it, whatever you do with your hands, I do with my feet. So, like, ride, eat, mow the lawn, uh, use chainsaw, which is not a, Great life decision at all. Um, uh, I am. I've just been super, super blessed in, in the fact that it's like God really did. I think stamp on my heart just an inherent understanding that I didn't come with the equipment that you guys came with. Um, but God, in His grace, gave me uh, some pretty talented toes, so I've been able to uh, to just navigate life using using my feet as my hands. So you know, brought me to the place where it's like, you know, I graduated high school with honors, went to college on a full scholarship, I met the girl of my dreams, good grief, 20 years ago now. We've been married 18 years. We got a 12-year-old boy, nine-year-old little girl back back home in North Carolina. Um, I have a ministry that, that I wouldn't trade the world for. So it's like, from the physical aspect of things, God has been incredibly kind uh, and incredibly gracious. Um, but, I, but I will say this, like, my struggle, especially in the first probably half of my life, but it's, you know, the, the struggle that I think rears its ugly head, even as I'm now in, in my 40s, is it's always a struggle of comparison. You know, it's like I always, I, I would always look around, especially as a kid, and see you guys with your fingers and hands and arms and I remember thinking a lot like, man, that must be nice. Must be nice to have an opposable thumb, you know, like I'm over here with my little stubby toes, you know, trying to do what you guys do with with your hands. And I think comparing myself to all of you guys really led me down this, this dangerous path where it's, especially as a teenager, I just felt like I wasn't good enough. Like, I felt like because I'm not you, because I can't do some of the things that you can do, because I don't look like you, then then clearly God doesn't love me like he loves you. That that was that was the conclusion. That was sort of the path that it led me down. And, and especially as a, as a 15 year old, I, I was just in this place where it's like I question God, God's love and God's purpose. I question my own worth and value. Like I, w- I was just in this really, really awful place. And God in his sovereign grace as a 15-year-old just so happened to put the right kid at the, at the lab table right beside me in biology class. One Friday, it's like last bell rang. We're packing up our stuff. We're getting ready to go home. And he looks me in the eye and he goes, hey, bro. Uh, we're we're gonna have this like thing at our thing at our church tonight. It's like a lock in. You want you want to come and hang out? And I'm like, oh okay, because it's like you know if any of you guys have been involved in uh, in youth ministry for any given amount of time, uh, lock ins are just a cesspool of sin. Uh, that's like that, you know like. 
it is it is basically depravity and caffeine is like the only the only two good parts about lock-ins and so my 15 year old self was like let's go and uh, and so i show up at this thing and literally as i walk in i realize i had made a mistake because my dude left out a, a super crucial crucial detail that it was a dodgeball lock-in and um and so it's like I talked a really big game about like, I can do what you can do, but I can do it with my feet. Um, I cannot dodgeball uh, at, at all. And so it was like straight up bloodbath, just get beaten to death at, at this stupid thing. And, uh, and so it's like some, somewhere early on in the night, I like tapped out. I went and sat in the bleachers of the, of the gym that they were having this thing in. And, um, and so I was just sitting there by myself sulking, and, and the student pastor who had put this whole thing on, he saw me off to the side and he thought he would come smooth things over. And so he comes, he sits beside me. And so we had a conversation with this guy. I mean, I, I asked him what was the most pressing question in my heart at that time was just, dude, why doesn't God love me? Because I feel like if God loved me, I wouldn't be walking through this life that I'm in right now. And that man spent the next hour showing God's love for me based on God's word and God's promises. And he just took me from scripture to scripture to scripture. And I will, I mean, good grief, this was, this was 25 years ago now. And I will never forget two of the scriptures he shared with me, Psalm 139, where the psalmist just says, God, you have fearfully and wonderfully made me. You have knit me together in my mother's womb and I will praise you for wonderfully your works. And he goes on to explain to me, he says, listen, like you've spent your whole life, at least by the outside world, being told you're just this mistake. You're a mutation. Like God messed up when he made you. But he's like, I need you to know God shows his love for you and the fact that he decided, you know what? This one doesn't need the same equipment as everybody else. And I'm going to use him to show the world more of me. God shows his love and care and grace for us in how he very carefully and uniquely designs us. But then I'll never forget, he, he flips the conversation on its head and he says, listen, like the, the greatest issue in your life is not your disability. The greatest issue in your life, it is your sin. God is a holy God. He cannot be in relationship with, with sinful people like us. So what in the world is, is going to happen to bridge that gap between a sinful you and a holy God? Well, Romans chapter 5 says that God shows his love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Jesus dies for us. Like y'all, for me to realize the greatest issue in my life being my sin and the only person who could solve that issue was the only person who lived a perfect life, who died the death that I should die on a cross and who was raised to life to show his authority over both sin and death. And the promise is this, for those of us who confess him as Savior and Lord, God saves us from our sin and he adopts us into the family of God. That's how much he loves us. And y'all, for me that night, to see God's love for me on God's terms in God's gospel changed my life. Not only in Jesus saving me from, from my sin and my mess and Jesus giving me an identity and a hope, but then here's the crazy thing that happens is now Jesus has given me a mission. Because it's like Jesus has changed my life. Jesus has given me so many things that that I never could have earned on my own. And so now what in the world do I do with all of these things that I've gained in him? Well, I, I, I guess I better share it or I'm the most selfish person in the room. And so in Jesus saving me, Jesus now gives me a story to tell. And that's exactly what I want you guys to see this morning. If you have trusted and arrested in Jesus as your great hope, he calls you to go and share it. And that's what Paul begins to talk about here in Romans chapter 5. So read with me. Romans chapter 5, we're going to start reading in, uh, in, in uh, verse 1. And so the word of the Lord says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. So here's a few things I want us to see here from from Romans chapter 5. And the first thing is this. It is that in Jesus, we have a peace that doesn't make sense. In Jesus, we have a peace that does not make sense. The back half of verse 1. Well, truly, I mean the whole verse. Since we have been justified by faith, since we have been saved by trusting in the sacrifice of Christ, he says in the second half of verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, you can, I think, subconsciously trade out that with, with, from. Like, it's easy to read that we have peace from God through our Lord Jesus Christ and that it, it being a gift that he gives those of us who trust in him. That is a very biblical reality, but that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying here that because Jesus has saved us, because Jesus has clothed us in his righteousness, we are no longer at odds with God. Because Paul paints the picture, if your your Bibles are still open, look in verses 6, 8, and 10. Paul describes what our goodness, quote unquote, what our lives earn us in in our own actions. He says this in in verse 6. He says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Look down in in, in verse 8. But God shows his love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then look in verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So Paul describes you and me in our life in sin, before trusting in Jesus, verse 6, we, we are weak, we are ungodly. Verse 8, we are sinners. Verse 10, we are enemies of the creator and sustainer of the universe. Especially verse 10, that's pretty sobering that you and I decided to pick a fight with the one sovereign being in the entire universe. That's really stupid. You know, like... If you're going to, it's like, you know, if you were in high school and and you were trying to pick a fight with the kid wearing the white shirt, like the kid wearing the white shirt knows how the fight's going to go. He's not worried about getting blood on his shirt. He's going to wipe you out. Like y'all for us in this situation, we go into a fight with an all powerful, all sovereign God. We lose every time. But yet when we realize that we chose our sin, we chose our brokenness over God, and yet God in his grace gave us a way back to him, a way to be restored in our relationship with him so that for all who trust, we know exactly where we stand with him. Like y'all, if you are sitting in this room this morning and you've confessed Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you go to bed tonight and you don't have to wonder what God thinks about you. He sees you as his adopted son, as his adopted daughter, that he loves, that that he is growing, that he is gifted. That's not going anywhere. And so if God can settle the biggest issue in your life, the most pressing eternal need that you have in your life, if he can settle that completely and fully and wholly, God in his grace cares about all the other stuff in your life too. He cares about all the stresses that keep you up, all the things that you're freaking out about, all the things that you feel like you need to control and manage and fires you got to put out. What he is saying all along the way is, I've got you and I need you to trust me. If I can deal with your eternity, I can deal with your right now. And that's why he sprinkles his promises all through our life. And he's not removing us from our hardship, but he is providing both promise and peace in the midst of it. That's what a good father does. Good daddies don't remove their kids from hard times, but they do walk them through it. Like y'all with my two, with my two kids, like I'm never, I'm not the helicopter dad. I'm not trying to keep them from like skin knees and broken hearts and all this stuff. Like I want them to, to be able to walk through life, to realize what is waiting for them once they step out of, out of, you know, 
the the shelter of me being their daddy. I want to be able to encourage them and grow them. And so it's like, we're always putting them in situations where it's like, uh, I don't know about this. Like uh, last year, took them to Disney World for the first time. And so, you know, we were all excited, bought the tickets, bought the, you know, I don't know, Park Hopper Disney Plus Magic Genie Pass or whatever they call it, you know, and it's like, so we spent $8 trillion uh, to send the family to Disney. And then we realized we had never gone to a theme park ever. And so we're like, well, what if the kids hate roller coasters? We've just set $8 billion on fire. Like, what do we do? And so my wife had the brilliant idea of, we're just going to find the biggest, baddest thing that Disney has. And that's going to be the first ride we ride. Because then it's all downhill. I was like, it's genius. And, uh, and so uh, Disney had just opened a ride called Tron, which if you're familiar with the movie, in the movie they ride these space motorcycle things. And, um, and so in this ride, you basically sit on the space motorcycle. They sort of smush you in there. You go zero to 60 in the first two and a half seconds. And then in the first turn, you pull four Gs, which is like you feel four times the, the force of gravity on your body. And this is all in the first seven seconds. And so we're explaining this to our children and they look like they're about to die, you know, like they're, they're not excited. And so it's like, we're gassing them up. You know, I'm encouraging them. It'll be fine. You're not going to die. You ain't got nothing to worry about. It's going to be great. You know? And, uh, and so I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm being their greatest encourager. What they did not know is I have never been on a roller coaster in my life. And, uh, and so I'm speaking out of total ignorance, but it's like, it's not my fault. Cause I, I bet you I've been to 20 theme parks in my life every single time. I'm maybe there five minutes and their little like insurance guy with his thick Coke bottle glasses is going to find me and come over to me. And he's going to look me dead in the eye and go, listen, buddy, I see the whole armless situation. And uh, what I need you to know is we can't let you ride any of the rides because if your harness fails, which I'm like, this is the county fair. Like if my harness fails, you know, um, but if my harness fails and I can't hold on, I fly off the ride, I die and I make them look bad because they killed the armless guy. I'm like, it's like a PR nightmare. And so they never let me ride any of these rides. And so we're going through the line. We get to the first Disney employee and I look my kids dead in the eye and I'm like, bye. And they're like, where, where are you going? And I'm like, oh, and you know, I started to explain it to them. And the Disney employee, she's sitting there listening. She's like, oh, sir, I have great news for you because this is, this is our newest ride that this is now Americans with Disability Act accessible. And so there's a car in the back for people with disabilities. So come, <laughs> come right this way. And I'm like, yay. Um, and so I now get to ride a roller coaster for the first time in my life. I don't remember anything um, that happened on that stupid roller coaster. It was really sketchy at best. And, uh, and I remember stepping off the roller coaster, trying not to pass out, like trying to just get over to the wall. And my kids come like bounding over to me like two little happy kangaroos. And they're like, dad, 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 dad. And I'm like, well, what'd you think? They're like, it was awesome. Let's do it again. And I'm like, Yay! And uh, so we, we rode that stupid roller coaster again. It was terrible for like my whole digestive tract that day. Um, but as a daddy, like to see my kids, they're like staring down the barrel of fear before we get on that ride. I'm trying my best to encourage them all along the way. They come out on the other side and they're sitting there going, you know what? My daddy was right. Really, I really didn't have anything to worry about. Let's let's do this again. Like that very much so is the picture of our Christian life. There are so many times in our life where we're staring down the barrel of fear or uncertainty or trials or brokenness. And we have a good and kind and loving father that is speaking promises over us the entire time. And more often than not, it's not till we come out on the other side and we go, you know what? My daddy was right. My daddy had me this whole time. I didn't have anything to worry about. That's the peace that you and I have when we trust our entire lives to a kind, powerful, sovereign God. 
Second thing I want us to see from this text this morning is this. It is that because of Jesus, we have a joy that's bigger than our circumstances. Because of Jesus, we have a joy that's bigger than our circumstances. Paul is going on to say in verses two and three, basically he lays it out like this. He says, listen, like for us to rejoice, we don't have to have the perfect job, the perfect family, the perfect wife, the, the, the chock full 401k. We don't need all of the things that the world says we need for a good and happy life. I love what Paul says in verse two, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and we rejoice in our sufferings. That you and I, we can have joy in this life first and foremost, what he's saying there in verse two, in us rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, it is that one day we will see Jesus face to face. One day, all of this brokenness, all of this hurt, all of this pain, all of this darkness, all falls away. And we just get him when we step into eternity. He's our reward to be loved by him, for us to love him, for us to worship him, for us to see him face to face. Paul puts it like this in Philippians 1.21. He says, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like as long as I'm gonna carry on in this life, I'm gonna make it about Jesus. And then the moment that I die, the moment that I pass from this life to the next, I get to see the person I've lived my whole life for in the first place. When we get to the finish line, we get him as our reward. And so even when this life is hard, we know that this is just temporary. Like this whole armless thing for me is just a season. It might be a 60, 70, 80 year season, I don't know. But I know once this season passes, it's all gone and I just get him. I don't have to worry about any of the mess that comes with this life that I live. I just, I just get him. And that's what we look forward to because we even, and you guys have seen it in this series because he goes on to say it in verse three, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that God is sovereign in them. God is showing us more of his character, more of his work in the moments that we realize we don't got this, but he surely does. And that's why we can rejoice because we're really coming to grips with the fact that I am broken and frail and he is not. That is the hope, that is the joy that we have in him. And the last thing I want us to see from this text this morning is that we have a hope worth living and a hope worth sharing. Paul goes on to say in verses, uh, the back half of verse four going into verse five, he says that character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So here's the thing about hope. The world has dumbed down hope in just all of the wrong ways. Like there is a massive difference between like worldly hope and true biblical hope. Like worldly hope is for you Texan fans that are sitting in here going, we're not terrible at football now. Like we, we, we're good. We're good at football. We, we might, we might make the playoffs. We might make the Super Bowl this year. And so for you, like Texan fans, you have all like, you've got your lucky CJ Stroud jersey that you haven't washed in 18 months, that, that you wear every Sunday and you sit on the same spot in the same couch, you eat the same things. And you think that your little football voodoo is going to help them get a win. That's, that's what worldly hope is, is maybe just maybe if I do all the right things, it'll break my way. Y'all, the, the hope that we have in Jesus is not remotely that flimsy because we have placed not only our eternity in his hands, but we have placed our entire life in his hands for a God who never fails, who has always done what he said he is going to do. And he is actively doing what he promised he will do for his church. That's where my life is. So it's like, ultimately it's this, my hope is not flimsy because my hope is not in me. My hope is in him. That, that is the hope that we have in the, the picture that Paul begins to paint is because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That word pour 
I, I guess the, the best visual example of that would be you guys go to Whataburger after church today and you're getting your little after church patty melt and fries and spicy ketchup. And then you go to fill up your Dr. Pepper and the little Dr. Pepper button gets stuck. And so it starts filling up your gigantic 80 ounce Whataburger cup and it fills it all the way up to the top and then it starts spilling out of the top of your cup and dropping down into that little fountain drink drain at the, at the bottom of the cup and it just pours and pours and pours and pours. That's the love that we have in God. He doesn't give us just enough. He pours his love into our lives for the explicit purpose that we would not hoard it, but that we would share it. When Jesus has changed your life. When Jesus has given you hope, why in the world would you not share that with the world? And you have opportunities every day in your own home, at your own job, in this community, standing in line at HEB, like, I I, I don't know. But you, you have a mission field day in and day out. And sometimes it just means being willing to to use what you got right in that moment. Like for me, it's the gas station. I have more gospel conversations with people at gas station than any other place on the planet. Because I pull in and I get out of the car. And the moment I get out, I feel people sort of like squirrely looking at me like, there is no way that armless man drove that car into this gas station. Like this is this is not legal. And uh, And so it's like, I'll sort of feel the uneasy looks at first and then I'll go over and I can't keep anything in my pocket. So I keep my debit card in my shoe. And so I'll pull my debit card out and I'll put it in the credit card reader and I'll punch in my pin number or whatever. And when I do that, every single human being in the gas station is just straight up staring now because they want to see, they want to see how the rest of this plays out. And so I'll take the gas pump, I'll stick it in the side of my car And this is where it gets really complicated for me because I have to lie flat on my back, stick both feet up in the air like I'm a dead possum so I can use one foot to like clamp down on the gas handle and the other foot to put that kickstand thing down to keep the gas pumping the whole time. So when I'm laying dead on my back in the gas station, all the people who have been staring at me now think that whatever bear has ripped my arms off, that I am now bleeding to death and or dead in the middle of the gas station. So it is like straight panic when people pop around my car, pop around the gas pump, and they're like, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm great. Uh, It's almost fall. Pumpkin spice latte season. I'm doing great, man. How are you? And uh, and now they're really confused that it's like I'm not unconscious, you know. And uh, and so it's like in this moment, I truly like I'm, I'm I'm faced with two choices. Like either I can brush them off, and we can all just go about our lives, or or I can strike up a conversation with a person I'm probably never gonna meet again, and just share with them how God took this armless life and gave me hope in the midst of my mess. To have the picture perfect gospel conversation just because of the opportunity that God literally laid in my lap. You have those opportunities every day. It doesn't look like dying in the middle of a gas station, but it might look like having gospel conversations with your neighbors, meeting their needs, loving them, listening to your friends in the midst of their hurt and their heartache, loving a coworker that might be the most unlovable person on the face of the planet, like giving yourself the space and the margin to tell of a savior who has changed your life comes in all sorts of shapes or sizes, but it is realizing that God is sovereign enough that he has placed me in this situation and he has given me everything I need to make him known. I just have to say yes. That is the life and the opportunity that God has set right in front of you guys this morning. And so the question very simply is, do you trust him? Do you trust him, number one, to save you from your sins? Because I fully recognize there are some people in this room this morning that have not trusted and rested in Jesus as their savior from their sins. And if you need to make that decision this morning, man, come talk to one of these guys at the end of service. But maybe for a lot of us, we've already made that choice. 
but we need to walk out of this place like it's true. We, we need to walk out of these double doors this morning and live like Jesus really is our hope. We need to talk like Jesus really is our hope. We need to realize that he has changed our lives enough, not so that we're selfish about it, but that we would go. And I pray that that's true of every single one of us that have been changed by his grace and his gospel this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the folks in here. God, I thank you. God, that even in the midst of our mess and of our sin, God, you sent, you sent your son to live the perfect life we never will, to die the death we should die, to be resurrected to life so that we could know eternal life because of his work and grace. Father, this morning, I pray if there's people in here that haven't trusted in you to save them from their sins. God, I pray this is the morning that they take that step. And Father, I do pray for all of us who have made that decision to follow you. God, I pray we would follow your call for our life as we walk out of here today, as we walk into our homes, as we walk into our jobs, as we step into this community. God, help us to be the walking, talking pictures of your hope, of your joy, of your peace in the life that you have given us. God, may we live like you are our everything. And may that overflow into the lives of everyone that we touch and see and interact with. Father, we love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.